Well, thanks again, Christina, and thanks everybody for tuning in tonight to talk all about Purple Martins in Chicago, one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, like Christina said, I am an illustrator. I'm also a research and collections assistant at the Field Museum, not in the birds department though, in the mammals division. Um, but most importantly, for tonight's purposes, I am a Chicago Park District volunteer for the Purple Martin Towers down at their South Shore Tower site. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about four different um, areas. I'm gonna start with an overview of Purple Martins for those of you who aren't as familiar with them, though I'm sure many of you are. Then I'm going to get into um, the story of how I established a new colony at the South Shore site in 2021. Then I'll switch gears and talk about how um, in collaboration with the birds division at the Field Museum, we just set up a new tower site that we're hoping to activate. And finally, I will introduce a new uh, citywide Purple Martin research program that I'm involved with, with uh, led by researchers at the Field Museum as well. But first, a little bit about Purple Martins. They are fabulous, I think, wonderful, neotropical migratory songbirds. They are super charismatic, so social, super vocal, and really not all that afraid of humans compared to other birds, which makes them an absolute pleasure to interact with and care for. They are the largest swallow in North America. And despite their name, Purple Martin, they're not actually purple, but a deep iridescent blue that covers the backs of the females and the fronts and backs of the males. Their body size is like just slightly smaller than a starling, but their wingspan's a little bit bigger. So overall kind of starling sized. You can see how they're bigger than other swallows that we see around here though. There's actually three subspecies of purple martins. There's the one we're familiar with um, that has the range, which is the big purple blob on the map there, Progne subis subis. Uh, but there are two Western subspecies. There's Progne subis arbic arboricola, I always pronounce that wrong, and Progne subis hesperia. The Western subspecies will still tend to nest in natural cavities like dead tree snags or holes in cacti. But the purple martins we know and love are almost entirely dependent on human provided nesting structures. And uh, you can see here from this little roundup, they come in many sizes and shapes and designs, um, but they've been provided by humans for hundreds of years now. There are some stories about Native Americans uh, setting them up for martins around their crops, but this is unverified. Good story though. And these houses require human caretakers um, in order to stay clean and available for their use. It's actually a hobby that's falling uh, to the wayside as owners uh, age out and young people aren't really taking up the cause. So it'll be really important to maintain and continue um, in years to come to help support this species. Purple martins are actually experiencing a population crash, unfortunately. Uh, over a third of purple martins have been lost in the past 50 years for a variety of reasons, but mostly it's due to nest site competitions with European starlings and house sparrows. So purple martins are long distance migrants. They overwinter mostly in the Brazilian Amazon basin. You can see it here on the Cornell lab map in blue and yellow down in South America there. And they gather in these enormous, what are called like super roosts where they can reach numbers in the hundreds of thousands. And then each spring they fly north to breed in North America with us and they return to the same sites every year. Here's a map that shows approximately what time of year martins are seen returning to the US. So if you start on the south, you can see that they hit the Gulf Coast in mid-January and then 
reach Chicago sometime around mid-April, late April, also known as right now, um, which is very exciting. For Martins to fly all the way from Brazil back to here is approximately 5,000 mile migration. And um, we found out recently that they, they make the trip really quickly. In 2007, um, some researchers attached the first geolocators onto the backs of Purple Martins and they were able to track the routes of a couple of them. And they saw how fast the journey was, 20 days. So um, with just a few stops, they were averaging 250 miles a day. They make the trip back in the fall a lot slower and researchers think this is probably because they're racing in the spring to compete with each other to get the best nesting cavity sites. So here is another map and it shows a really cool project that the Purple Martin um, Conservation Association, PMCA, hosts every year it, on their website, purplemartin.org. It's called their Scout Arrival Study. And people all over the US, um, they let the website know when they first see uh, mature adults or young first year sub-adults arriving to their Martin Tower sites every year and the site refreshes every day. And so you can track and anticipate the arrival of the Martins in your area. Here is the map from two days ago. I should have updated it for today, but it looked pretty similar. And you can see the purple dots are the mature adults and these yellow dots are the first year adults, um, Martins that were babies last year and are coming back to the US for the first time to be breeding adults this year. So purple Martins are pretty easy to identify in flight in Chicago against the other swallows and chimney swifts that we see in the sky alongside them. You can see how much bigger they are, how their wing and tail shape is different. And I often, I added the chimney swift on here because I'm often seeing chimney swifts at my site at the same time that I'm seeing uh, purple martins. If not, I'm also seeing tree swallows. I know this differs a bit amongst the different sites in the city. Martins also have a really distinct flying pattern. Um, it's really beautiful to watch and easy to identify once you get used to seeing it. When they're perched, um, it's a good time to try to sex and age purple martins on their perch poles or in trees. It can be difficult, adult females, sub-adult males, and sub-adult females and even fledglings all kind of have that speckly lighter chest and under tail feathers, whereas the males are the classic iconic iridescent blue. But if you start to focus in on the underside of the tail, you can see some key differences between a subadult male and an adult female. And then as the subadults mature, you can see they get those blue specks filling in on their chest as well. And then the cute babies, once they fledge, they don't have those pointy flying tail feathers yet. Um, and so that's an easy way to point out a fledgling from an adult. Martins are high altitude aerial insectivores. They're actually thought to be North America's highest foraging songbird, which is really cool. I didn't know this until recently. They've been detected on weather radar up to 4,000 meters in the air, which is very impressive. And um, there was a study that tracked them foraging for food for nestlings, and they uh, would average around 900 meters for their hunting. And so they're really getting insects that are way, way high up there in the sky, higher than other swallows and swifts that we're used to seeing around. They eat a variety of insects. Um, they tend to focus on social swarming insects. So that's a lot of ants and termites. And um, I would love to claim the way Griggsville, Illinois here does that they uh, can eat 2000 mosquitoes. Um, but unfortunately diet studies have shown that they are not big mosquito eater ears. They don't really show up in the stomach contents in purple martin studies. 
However, if you live in the South, I've heard that they can be pretty good at controlling fire ants and they'll collect tons of fire ants to feed to their babies down there. So that's something. So where are Chicago's purple martin sites? Here they are. This is a map of the lakefront. Um, you can see Navy Pier just above center. And starting from the north, I'll go through the Chicago Park District's four active sites. Um, the northernmost one is at Montrose Harbor. They have four towers. Bill Jarvis Bird Sanctuary is just about a mile south, and it has two clusters of towers, I believe six total. Uh, several miles south of that, we have the new Field Museum site, which is still inactive, but I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. There used to be towers at Northerly Island, but apparently um, when they re renovated the peninsula out there, they repurposed the towers to other sites. I don't know exactly which ones, but I think they were the north side sites. Then a few miles south, you have the Jackson Park Basin Towers located behind the Museum of Science and Industry. And finally, the South Shore Cultural Center uh, Towers that I monitor at 71st and the Lakeshore. I tried to do a little bit of digging into the history of Chicago Purple Mountain Martin Towers. I've just been curious about it. And uh, the Park District shared with me a scan of this old article by Carolyn Marsh, who was actually the first South Shore Tower monitor. Um, and, I, and it says that these sites were erected in 2001 and first opened their doors in 2002. Um, this coincided with the inauguration of the opening of the South Shore Nature Sanctuary. And I think the design for the site seems to have been conceived in partnership with the Purple Martin Society of North America, Illinois chapter which is pretty cool. South Shore was the first site to attract Martins. And there's a historical note here that said the last time for this was set up that Jackson Park had Purple Martins was 50 years earlier, which would make it back in 1952. If anyone has any information about the history of Chicago Purple Martins, I would love to fill in the blanks. So please reach out. So, now I'd like to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk to you uh, about the process I took to reestablish an active colony down at the South Shore Towers. So this is a video and it's gonna slowly pan through the South Shore site. We're looking right now at the putting green at the north, here are the three towers at the lake. And as I pan south, you'll see the tip of the South Shore Nature Sanctuary just beyond South Shore Beach. And the site had been monitored and active from 2002 to 2005, as I mentioned in that article but then laid dormant and closed for 16 years, I believe after the monitor just couldn't um, dedicate time anymore and they couldn't find a replacement. So uh, the site was long empty, definitely no birds. And uh, Lucy Gomez Feliciano, who until recently was the community stewardship program manager with the Nature Conservancy and the Park District, sort of a joint role, uh, reached out to me to see if I would be willing to uh, restart the site. She'd gotten my name from Susanna Ribstein, the natural area steward for the South Shore Nature Sanctuary, thought I'd be a good fit. And I said, sure, why not? Let's give it a shot. I knew absolutely nothing about Purple Martins, but I thought, okay, I accepted. And then COVID hit, 2020, and Mayor Lightfoot closed the lakefront to the public and only city personnel were allowed to access park district sites. Lucy opened and checked the towers periodically for me, um, but no Martins were sighted. However, when I did make it out there in the fall to close the doors and clean things out, I found one Martin egg, which was surprising. It was non-viable, obviously didn't hatch, but at least it was a sign of hope. 
So then when spring of 2021 came, I was ready. I was very excited to get started and very determined. The park district bought me some luring tools like this plastic little decoy martin on the left and what's called a songbird magnet that I am seeing there installing on the right. Songbird magnets have a solar sensor that triggers preloaded audio to play at first light for several hours. And the song is called the dawn song, which is a particular kind of chattering that the Martins make early in the morning at an active colony. So the idea was um, a martin will fly by, they will hear the chatter, they're very social, come check it out and we'll get our new, our new martin. Here is my husband Isaac and me cleaning out the towers for the first time in a long time to get them ready. Um, you can see the tower designs and the house designs here. Um, they're nice, you can bring them up and down on a, y on a winch with a handle so they're easy to access. The doors open and inside is a removable nest box in each cavity. If you flip the cavities around, like you can see in the photo I'm in, uh, they act as door plugs. So in the off season, nothing else can find its way inside. Note here that the door openings to each of the nests is a circle. So anyway, we put on the decoys, we opened the towers, everything's clean and ready. And then within, I think, 24 hours, the whole site was swarmed with starlings. Starlings were taking over each tower in multiple nest cavities and they were really aggressive. I could tell that we had to make some changes fast or we were never going to attract Martins to the site. So, we took up the doors really quick. The park district helped us get a different style of opening called a Connolly entrance. And we changed the doors at home and plopped them back on um, as quick as we could and hoped for the best. In the meantime, I was sort of disillusioned with the birdsong magnet that I'd been trying out at the site. The audio quality of the box was already deteriorating and it just wasn't really loud. So I decided I was gonna switch to a Bluetooth speaker and it downloaded MP3 of the same chatter from YouTube and go out there in the dawn and just play it myself in the mornings. So remember what I was trying to lure were these yellow dot birds, these uh, birds that were babies the year before, but were adults, new sub-adults coming back for the first time to find their own site to breed for the first time. These youngins are the ones that are, be, that are most likely to set up a new colony um, because they might try to return to where they were born, but the colony is already full and there aren't any available nest cavities. So that's who I was shooting for. So I went out uh, 30 minutes before dawn for 22 days, not in a row, but almost in a row. And it was beautiful but difficult and I played the song um, and I'm gonna let you just listen to it for a moment. It's uh, this is the dawn song chatter. So that's the chatter. And after the 22nd session, after sunrise, I was just cleaning up one of the towers and just about ready to head out when a male sub-adult scout came swooping around the site. I still had the tower hanging on the handle of the middle tower. There you can see it, the Bluetooth speaker just hanging on the handle. And so the song was still playing and he just came, seemed curious, uh, landed on each of the poles. Um, I sort of snuck away and hid next to the fence here. <laughs> That's how you can see me next to the fence post, trying not to scare him away. Um, and he stayed for about 15 minutes uh, before he left. And I panicked thinking, oh, he's never gonna come back. But uh, I grabbed my binoculars and got a couple of shots of him before he did. Don't be uh, confused by the decoy there. Uh, he's the one on the porches or on the perch pole. And then two days later, 
when I came in the morning, he was there on his favorite perch that he had picked out with a meat. Aren't they wonderful? I was so excited. This is May 24th, 2021. So that was the start of things. And over the next two to three days, the site grew quickly. There were two pairs, then three pairs, and six pairs. And the shot here shows eight of what became uh, 12 resident Martins for the season. It's hard to get all 12 in one shot, but I think that's eight. And so the 2021 season progressed pretty smoothly. We had six nests, 22 eggs. Some of the um, nest builders were better than others. Sometimes a young bird would just stick one leaf in a nest box and then lay eggs, but they would seem to learn as the season went on. Then from the 22 eggs, we had 17 hatchlings. And then from the 17 hatchlings, we had 14 successful fled fledglings. And the 12 parents and their 14 fledglings hung around for the first half of August before they all headed south on their fall migration to their wintering grounds. The winter that followed was very, very long as I waited to see if the birds would return to the site or if I would have to start all over again with the luring process. But season two was wonderful. It was full of rapid growth. They returned. The first pair returned on April 23rd. We had 15 active nests. 68 eggs, 59 hatchlings, 55 fledglings. So that's four times the number of fledglings from year one. And you can see all the parents with all the fledglings here in August, right at the end of the season, before they made their way south again. So overall, a very successful season. We also expanded our outreach efforts. I tried to maintain a small um, Instagram account, Purple Martins of South Shore. Lots of passerbys and um, followers of that account would help participate in nest checks and learn all about Martins and the new site. And I even had a neighbor, a teen, um, help me record data and learn about the process. So hopefully we're in for an equally active third season at the site this year. Switching gears again. And rewinding to 2020. Excuse me, I'd like to walk you through a parallel project that I worked on alongside the reestablishment of the South Shore Tower site. And that is the establishment of a new Martin Tower site at the Rice Native Gardens at the Field Museum. You can see the red circle. They're showing up already on Google Satellite, which is pretty cool. There's two little white boxes are the towers there. So during the COVID lockdown, I began brainstorming with Field Museum Bird Division staff about possibly um, setting up a new site on museum grounds. And apparently this had been on staffers' minds for a while. So when I offered to handle the logistics and the ordering and the planning, they enthusiastically gave me the green light. And so in the spring of 2021, we reached out to the Purple Martin Conservation Association for advice on how to design our site. And their president, Joe Segrist, was awesome and very generously helped us out with our purchase of these two T14 tower kits that you can see here. He gave us advice on what to buy and how to choose our specific location. So then in the spring of 2021, we installed two towers with hanging gourds on the north side of the museum. In the photo, you can see me, curator of birds, John Bates up there on the top of the ladder and biologist and Pritzker lab um, molecular specialist, Dylan Maddox working on this on the setup. It was tough, but we got it done. So then in 2021 and 2022, uh, for both spring seasons, I replicated the dawn song 
audio luring process. Um, but this year, with the help of our operations manager at the museum, Eric Boyle, um, the, and the museum's media team, we're installing a custom designed solar powered speaker with a timer to automate the process, which is awesome for me because I don't have to go out before sunrise anymore. Um, so hopefully this will really help increase the number of hours the audio is playing there and increase our chances of luring Martins to the site. It should actually get installed this week, so fingers crossed. And while we haven't gotten Martins to the site yet, it has been incredible um, to see how much it's engaging the public just to have the towers there. Staff have been able to use it as an interpretive tool to explain the value of the native gardens um, that are eventually going to help feed the Martins with the insects that it attracts. And um, it just seems like it's already uh, a real attraction point and a great extension of our exhibits to the exterior of the building. So stay tuned for what will hopefully be good news in the next couple of months. And finally, I uh, want to share a little bit about a new Purple Martin research program that we got started in 2021 as well. This is a collaboration between the Park District and the Field Museum that I'm really excited about. The idea is to collect data from all of the active Park District colonies that I've already talked about along the lakefront. And so the data collection will, it, it includes a variety of sample types. So blood samples, measurements of the birds, feather samples, and collecting unhatched or non-viable eggs. This is paired with um, the nest check data that uh, dedicated volunteers are already collecting at the sites each season that tracks the nest and behavior throughout the season. So really helpful data on their end as well. When we're there, we also band each bird um, that we sample so that we can track recaptures and see if nestlings born at one site end up breeding at another nearby or not nearby, maybe. Uh, we attach two bands, one US Fish and Wildlife band plus a color auxiliary band, and each site in the city gets its own color. These data will be valuable for answering several possible research questions, um, and maybe more, including um, parentage questions. There are some theories that some male Martins might take care of babies that are not biologically theirs. So we'd be interested to see if that's occurring. Uh, we can track the presence or absence of avian malaria across the different sites. We could conduct diet studies, and even track migration paths of the birds as they come and go from Brazil each year. So lots of possibilities. Featured here in the photo is the PI for this project, Dylan Maddox. Uh, you saw him setting up the towers of the Field Museum in, a, in an earlier photo. He's at the Field Museum's Pritzker lab. He's a molecular lab specialist and an evolutionary biologist. Here are two photos of the sampling in action. You can see we take a, a tiny bit of blood and we dab it onto what's called a Wattman card. That's that white card with the dots of blood on it. Each bird gets its own little box. And then that's shelf stable for sampling in the future. And then there's a little nestling sitting in a box getting weighed with some unused leg bands in the background. So we have to time when we go out to the sites for the research project pretty carefully because uh, we need to catch the nestlings in the nest boxes at a very specific point in their development. And this is what we're targeting, uh, circled in red. We want to make sure the nestlings are old enough to get their legs banded without hurting them, but not too old to get spooked and fledge the nest prematurely while we're opening them up. So this occurs uh, approximately between day 10 and 20 days old for the nestlings. Here's a shot of active sampling out at Montrose Harbor, a gorgeous site if you haven't visited it. And here are some stats for our two uh, sampling seasons so far. So up top, season one, 
we banded and sampled at Montrose Jackson Park in South Shore. And the numbers next to each name are the total nestlings that we sampled and banded. Below this season two, where we added Bill Jarvis Bird Sanctuary. And you'll see we started uh, last year uh, capturing some adults as well, which will be really important for tracking the parents of the nestlings. Um, and we were lucky that Dylan, Project PI Dylan on the right there, has a very high tech technique for capturing the adults that he's found from somebody online, I can't remember who, where you put a paint roller on the nest box when it's when the house is up in the air, then I would that I would run up, bring the house down while he's plugging the hole with this soft clean roller. Then he sneaks his hand in and gets the adult. And then we can band and sample it. And then we also know which nest cavity its babies are in and which ones it's re biologically related to because we know which one it went inside. So then we release the bird, let it get back to its business and um, really great extra data set that we hope to add to in the future. So what's next? Um, there's lots going on. Of course, um, top of mind is luring a new Martin colony to the Field Museum. That would be absolutely wonderful. We're going to continue banding and sampling at all four active sites across the lakeshore. We'd love to get more of those adults in their nest with Dylan's new high-tech system. And we want to expand our outreach to share our project and what we're doing just like I'm doing here tonight. And it takes a lot of people to take care of these birds, their houses um, across lots of different communities in the city. And I just wanna say thank you to all who have helped me directly or indirectly with my efforts from the Chicago Park District, staff and monitors to the Field Museum, the Purple Martin Conservation Association, and of course, family, friends, and neighbors who have all rallied around. And if you wanna keep up with Purple Martins on Instagram, there are two accounts, one for Montrose Harbor, and I uh, kind of maintain one as best as I can for South Shore as well. And with that, I will restart my video. And if anybody has questions, be happy to try to answer. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. That was fantastic. I'm so glad I ran into you at South Shore while you were doing your monitoring. I think it was 2021. So, yeah, me too. Uh, I, we have a, a few questions um, in the chat. Um, okay. Just a reminder, if you have a question for Lauren, go ahead and, and just type that in. Um, the first question we have is from Pat. Are the windows on the houses lockable so people can't just raise and lower them on a whim? Oh, thank God, yes. Yes. Yeah, that would never, ever work otherwise. There are padlocks um, with keys that very few people have. And uh, yes, locked. <laughs> OK, well, that makes us feel much better. They're, they're secure. Yes. OK, uh, why can't purple martins in the Chicago area nest in natural areas? It's a good question. I, I know we do have tree snags, so why don't they choose them? Um, the answer that I've found most often online, um, so I tend to go with, is that they are outcompeted for those nest cavities by uh, sparrows and starlings. It's really just, um, just an issue of competition at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we have a question from Janet. Um, hate to put someone on the spot here, but um, Carolyn Marsh is is you know in our in our Zoom right now, and Janet was it wondering has... if Carolyn wanted to share anything about her um, her involvement and history. Um, if Carolyn, if you're willing to, you can go ahead and share whatever you'd like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes. Uh, I just wanted to say that we need volunteers at Wolf Lake, the state park on the southeast side of Chicago. I put up uh, some Martin houses there that I donated many uh, a decade ago, and um, I'm just not able to take care of them. And I put out a request for help. And um, it's active, it's an active colony. All we have to do is um, 
raise the uh, houses and open them up. They're the old fashioned ones. We could use some new ones at Wolf Lake, but it's an active colony there. I just want to say that I was one of the uh, initiators uh, to start the Purple Martin projects on Chicago Park land at Jackson Park and South Shore for sure. I monitored there for years. And then we all, uh, there were monitors at Lincoln Park, which do a fantastic job. I wish I knew all their names, but they do a fantastic job. Uh, it all started in Indiana. I live in Whiting, and we've had a hundred year history of purple martins nesting in Indiana along the shoreline in Whiting. And uh, the old timers would put up houses, handmade houses. And um, when I moved there, uh, you know, I became an avid bird watcher and bird conservationist. And I got a hold of the Purple Martin Society in Illinois. And I says, hey, what about, you know, banding the birds in, in, in uh, Whiting? And there was some banding that went on. Then that's where we got the idea uh, to talk to the Chicago Park District to set up houses at Jackson Park and at South Shore. And nobody thought that they would come. They came immediately. No recordings, nothing. They came immediately in both Jackson Park and South Shore. So I'm very excited that there is a new uh, interest in the Purple Martins. If, if it is <laughs> a 20 year hiatus uh, is a long time. And we really, they, they are delightful birds to have in around. I tell you, they're so exciting to see and to hear them chirping. And I hope we get a lot of volunteers because you will definitely be rewarded. Your life will be so enhanced if you become a Purple Martin landlord. Yay. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, and then Lauren, if, if you need volunteers, are you, are you in need of volunteers or are you doing okay on your side? I have had such a wonderful outpouring of offers, so I'm happy to report that I'm well supported. Um, but I, you know, it, it can't hurt to reach out to whatever uh, tower site is closest to you that you're interested in. And, um, you know, eyes on the towers and walking around them and visiting them helps the Martins. So, the more eyes we have on them, caring for them and making sure they're just well treated by the public is always, always appreciated. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, Mrs. Black call for questions. And while you think of your last question, I, I have a question for you. Um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but last year you had obviously a lot of babies. Was every slot in the next, like every nest spot taken? No, we had, so let me think about this. We had, I think, 15 nests out of a possible 55-0 nests. So we have lots of room to grow, which I'm really excited about. I mean, if we if we quadrupled our size from year one to year two, I mean, if we, we could do that again this year, it'd be really exciting. Um, that would max us out. But if we grow a little bit, uh, I'll be psyched. We'll see how it goes. They were they arrived April 23rd last year, and now we're April 25th. I went yesterday morning. Definitely no birds yet, but if you're out there at South Shore and you see a Martin, DM me through Instagram and uh, say, I see the Martins, and I'm going to run down there so I can mark the data on my sheet and have a good recording of the first appearance for this year. Um. I will move on to the next question. Uh, what new sites would you like to launch? Well, um, a million, but I will say that every site, sites are a lot easier to build and fundraise for and set up than they are to maintain and monitor. And so new sites really are about building new communities and building new, uh, dedicated long-term volunteers to commit to the sites that we do invest in. So 
I would love to see uh, a push farther south along the lake shore. I'd love to see Steelworkers Park. I'd love to see Big Marsh um, throughout the Calumet region would be awesome. I'd love to see um, us stretch up into Evanston and, you know, sky's the limit. It really, really is just about finding those people who are in it for the long haul and willing to uh, keep coming back year after year. Um, why is it important to play the sound at dawn? Oh, um, you can also lure martins with something called daytime chatter. Martins have a lot of different vocalizations um, and they're specific to the time of day and the situation the martins are in. Daytime chatter um, just tends to not come at the right time for when a migrating bird would tend to be passing by the site to select it. Migration happens um, at night for many birds and martins as well. And so um, something about that window of time, 30 minutes before sunrise is indicated as being a higher success rate for catching those martins that are actually actively seeking a site rather than just foraging or flying around within their range after they've come to their site. That makes sense. Um, do you know if the boxes with the Connolly entrance style are uh, for sale for the public? Sounds like we have a starling <laughs> issue yeah. maybe. Yeah. They 100% they are, and um, the Purple Martin Conservation Association, purplemartin.org, on their shop, sells them. That's where I got ours. That's where I get everything for Purple Martins. They are one-stop shop. They are super helpful. Um, I'm sure there are other great places, too, but they've just been uh, a godsend for me. So I would point you there. They're not very expensive. And they've been really helpful. Although I will say I have the Connolly entrances on the field museums towers and the sparrows could not care less. So they solve the starling problem, but they do not solve the sparrow problem. And so as long as you're willing to continue fighting sparrows, at least it's half the battle. Okay, great. Um, and do you monitor the gourds? Uh, we, we saw on some of those houses there were gourds on the side and how do you do that? Yeah, so they, uh, when, they when the whole house comes down, the gourds come with it and um, there is a screw, tap, screw cap on the side of the gourd that you can uh, take off and get your whole hand in there and um, access the inside. Mostly I do that just to pull out hornet's nests at this point because Martins don't seem to like the gourds for me. Um, I've heard anecdotally that the Montrose folks are going to do their best to try to promote gourd use this year. Uh, I think there's um, evidence showing that the Purple Martins will choose higher cavities first and then work their way down. And just the fact that the gourds are lower might be part of it. I'm not really sure. Um, but Yes, you can access the gourds and we do monitor them. They're part of the nest check process. Uh, what's the ideal habitat for purple martins to put up houses? They're actually, they're actually kind of picky, so it's a good question. Um, you want to be 130, I learned this from setting up the field museum, that you want to be 130 feet from a large structure like a house, for example, and you want to be um, I think it's 60 plus feet from a decent sized shrub or tree. Um, you want to be within a kilometer of water, but you know, along the side of a lake or pond is ideal. Closer than a kilometer is better for sure. They don't like to worry about whether or not uh, predators are going to be in shrubs, tall grasses, or trees right around the base of their towers. So um, on a grassy lawn or shorter vegetation is preferred. And again, just like open space, because think of them as like, I don't know, like fighter jets. They're like, they're fast flyers and they're divers and they like to see far out in all directions around them. 
and they need access to insects. So it's like you need a like a carrier ship with a landing strip to receive them, if that makes sense. Great. And then um, can the weather affect your migration time? Absolutely. Um, especially big storms can speed up or delay. I think all songbird migration, as far as I understand it, I'm a very, very amateur birder. I think people on here probably understand this better than I do, um, but just tracking the weather radar, I know there are patterns that coincide with, with big uh, wind and weather patterns across the US. So yes, as they're coming from the Gulf Coast up um, through the Midwest, uh, I'm sure they are following a food source and temperatures that they can tolerate. So I think absolutely. Okay, great. I think that was the last question. Nope. Okay. <laughs> uh, it looks like there's an abandoned Purple Martin house at the Lincoln Park Zoo and Conservatory. Is there a reason it's not active? That you Ooh, excellent question maybe we need to start it up again. <laughs> I'd be happy to chat about it if someone is um, willing to go in on it long term. Uh, any, any new sites that get um, established would definitely be um, something we'd be interested in uh, incorporating into the research project through the Field Museum. For data collection. So please, please, um, like Wolf Lake, for example, I'm very excited to learn about it. And um, I'll talk to the team about whether we have the staff bandwidth and um, ability to add it to our program. But please let me know if, if you have sites as well that might be candidates. All right. I think that's it for questions. Um, just a quick announcement before we end. Um, if you really enjoyed our program, it's free and you want to support the programs that we do, please head on over to chicagobirder.org, check out our membership page to become a member or to donate, and you can check out our events page for upcoming online and in-person events. Most importantly, I'm going to thank Lauren so much for this amazing program. I can't believe you had no experience with Purple Martins before you started this. This is truly amazing work that you've done. Thank you. It was fun chatting. All right. I hope everyone has a good evening and that you have a great spring migration. See you next time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.